This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Dr. Ben White's here. And for those of you who enjoy our Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to iTunes and leave us a ratings and review and go to YouTube and, and sign up for... Um, to become a subscriber to our YouTube page, which is White's Cairo, or you can search for Rational Wellness in YouTube. So today our topic is how to deal with mood disorders like depression and anxiety by trying to balance our neurotransmitters. Depression is characterized by persistently depressed mood or a loss of interest in activities. And it affects more than 3 million Americans per year. In fact, it's been in the news a lot. There have been a series of, of celebrity um, suicides. So depression is really in the news. Um, and anxiety is characterized by feelings of worry, nervousness, or fear that are strong enough to interfere with one's daily activities. Depression and anxiety are typically treated by mainstream medicine with medications like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs, like Prozac, Zoloft, and Lexapro, which are among the most commonly prescribed medications in the United States. According to a new analysis of federal data by the New York Times, long-term use of antidepressants is surging in the United States. Some 15.5 million Americans have been taking the medications for at least five years, and the rate has almost doubled since 2010. Most of these antidepressants were originally approved by the FDA for short-term usage, and there's only a few studies lasting longer than a few years. But yet many patients are put on these drugs indefinitely, and it's very difficult to get off these drugs. A large percentage of patients who take them report severe withdrawal symptoms when trying to wean themselves off or are, un, are, are unable to wean themselves off. So other than talk therapy, what other approaches can help such patients? This is why I've asked Dr. Jess Armine to join us today for a functional medicine approach to dealing with mood disorders. Dr. Jess Armine is a doctor of chiropractic and a registered nurse. And he's been a healthcare professional for over 37 years. He's trained in chiropractic, methylation, genetic research, neuroendoimmunology, functional medicine, applied kinesiology, and cranial manipulation. Dr. Armine is one of the few specialists in the United States specializing in correlating genetic SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms like MTHFR, with neuroendoimmunology. He also correlates this with acquired mitochondrial dysfunction and cell wall integrity to help identify hidden imbalances, that's a mouthful, hidden stressors in the body. He developed individualized treatment plans specific to the health history and physiology of each patient. Dr. Armine, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity for being here and talking to your listeners. And that was a great introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. You know, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the chiropractic <laughs> profession because, you know, this just occurred to me this morning. For some reason, some of the smartest doctors in the functional medicine world like yourself, are chiropractors. I just yes. recently interviewed Dr. Tom O'Brien, Dr. Michael Ruscio. You know, uh, we were talking a little bit about Dr. Crosby. And so anyway, for whatever that's worth. Um, Dr. Armine, what got you so interested in researching and treating mood disorders? Well, it was a uh, when I became a chiropractor, um, you know, chiropractic is wonderful. I've, I had, I've always had a really good time with it. I always felt this... Um, draw to functional, what we now call functional medicine, okay? It was something that interested me because I could put puzzle pieces together. Uh, but essentially what threw me into high gear was my son, who is now 31, 
uh, developing schizophrenia at about age 14. And uh, I did exactly what every good father should do. I took him to the doctors and this child with 160 IQ who is, was glib and um, had, uh, frankly it exceeded me intellectually when he was 10, uh, became a non-entity with the medicines. Uh, he would sit there on the couch just rocking. And um, I'm a fairly spiritual guy and I, I looked up at, uh, at, at spirit at God and said, this disease is screwing with the wrong daddy. Uh, I apologize for the bad word. Uh, and I, I launched into uh, studies and, and as, it, as it would happen, I had a lot of good people put in front of me. And I learned an incredible amount of stuff that, uh, as you mentioned, the neuroendocrinology concepts, neurotransmitter balancing and so forth and so on, uh, that uh, helped me develop a methodology of treatment that looked at both ends of uh, a disease process and right down to the, uh, to the core molecular level. And, um, my, and I applied this with my son. Of course, I worked with an integrated psychiatrist also. And between us, he is now, he graduated college. He, was, he became an Eagle Scout when he was, uh, when he was younger. He was the uh, director of a nature program at a Boy Scout camp. He now runs a business on his own, uh, and he is himself. Okay, uh, he still has some issues, but you know something? He's a functional, uh, incredibly functional person. Uh, he is my hero, actually. That's a great uh, story. It really is. That's why I'm here. Okay, <laughs> and that's where my passion in the in the circles that I run in. Um, if anybody has comes to them and they have a you know severe neuropsychiatric challenges, okay, they tend to refer them to me because that's my passion. Figuring out why, base reasons, and the downstream effects is my passion, and I, and I like to think I'm pretty good at it. What, if you don't mind my asking, were there one or two keys that you thought were really helpful in your son's case? Yes. Uh, number one, uh, like I said, he was an Eagle Scout, so to think that he didn't get bitten by a tick is kind of foolish. Ah. So the Lyme disease, neural Lyme, was one of the issues. Uh, he, um, the medicines made him gain weight like crazy, and just the, the adipose tissue increased inflammation uh, to a degree, and think of inflammation like a forest fire, once it gets going, once it gets really going, and I, I, you're out in California, so you have a feeling for this. I'm in Pennsylvania. We don't see forest fires, okay? But they will just get so hot that they'll burn everything, even things that aren't supposed to burn, okay? So it feeds on itself. We know why now. That's in the whole cell danger response thing, uh, and we can interrupt that. Uh, but the keys were chronic cerebral inflammation, what's now called chronic inflammatory response syndrome, that can be done by biotoxins, by Lyme, by strep, by helmet, so many other things. Those were the keys to get to putting the fire down and then replenishing. Yes, it was done with medicines and nutraceuticals because of the severity of the pathology. And uh, as I'm explaining neurotransmitters, you'll see why. Um, so those were the keys. The keys were cleaning up his physiology, okay, because let's face it, the bugs don't like a normal environment. They like their own environment, okay? If you can do that and take care of what the bugs have done to you, that the damage they've done, reverse that. In other words, work from both ends. You're going to get, you know, even the most severe pathologies. And he was suicidal. He was seeing demons, of, you know. This, this is a boy that I would have committed suicide myself, okay? Uh, that's why he's my hero. I, I, I know... I meet very few people who can go through that and survive. That's awesome. Um, so what causes uh, the common mood disorders like anxiety and depression? Well, um, even though there may be arguments on both sides of the, uh, both sides of the issue, uh, there is no question that neurotransmitter imbalances cause uh, mood disorders, okay? Now remember that the neurotransmitter imbalances don't happen uh, by themselves, you know, and in a vacuum, they happen for reasons. Okay, so um, you know, typically we think of depression as being a serotonin issue. We think of anxiety as being uh, too many, too much adrenaline and too much dopamine. Uh, it's not always like that. Okay, it's really a matter of balance. Okay, so the neurotransmitter balance is what you're looking for, and also the imbalances are what cause. Um, cause the mood disorders, they are, the mood disorder, the resulting mood disorder is based on genetic predisposition, okay, with something causing 
that genetic predisposition to express, which is usually the, the neurotransmitter imbalance and the resultant mood disorder. Okay. Uh, if we look at it in a line like that. By, by the way, Doc, what are neurotransmitters? Okay. Neurotransmitters are substances that transmit neurological impulses from one nerve to another. Okay. Very simply, nerves are not connected. They have a synapse. Okay. You have the pre, the, we're not going to use big terms. Okay. They have a synapse. I'm going to exaggerate. Okay. Yeah. The neurotransmitters, yeah. the chemicals are sitting in warehouses called vesicles. Okay. And at the, when a nerve impulse comes down, okay, comes down. Okay. Somebody at the synapse, I always call him the warehouse guy, the, uh, you know, the guy with the hammer that says, Hey, send me some, I'm from, I'm from Brooklyn. Okay. Hey, send me a bit of serotonin here. I got to get this over there. Right. So the serotonin vesicles will release some serotonin into the synapse, take that, take that information, go to the other nerve and the nerve impulse continues. When that neurotransmitter, that substance goes off the receptor, it'll sit around in the synapse and does one of a few things. It either hangs out with its buddies for a while, or it gets broken down by COMT, catechol methyltransferase, or MAO, monoamine oxidase, or it gets reabsorbed. That's the reuptake, so it can be reused again. Okay, and so um, it gets like, it gets, that's, that's the normal process. So you're your food intake, your amino acid intake goes into the axons of the nerve and produces neurotransmitters. And so people have a good understanding. Hold on. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for a real, real short sure. uh, visual. Okay. Uh, this is the stressors that can affect the cell. This is what causes all the problems. This is from uh, the metabolic features of cell danger response by Dr. Navio, who's at the Metabolic and Mitochondrial Disease Center at the University of Southern California. He, if he, discovered all the things that can damage a cell, okay? And they're divided, as you might expect, for chemical, physical, heavy metal, benzene, yada, 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 okay? Uh, microbial, mold, fungi, bacteria, parasites. Parasites is biggie, by the way, okay? And what most people fob off as being non-essential or, or not significant are the whole psychological comp, uh, constructs of yelling, abuse, isolation, PTSD. So people who've been brought up in a non-nurturing environment people who were exposed to various forms of abuse on either a single or ongoing basis, okay, will damage the cells just as much as microbial or chemical influences, okay? So this is a little animation. We're going to talk about dopamine here, okay? Dopamine is created in the axon, as you can see, okay? And it's degraded by monoamine oxidase, but you see the little uh, vesicles where, it's, where it is... Um, stored. So when dopamine is necessary, those vesicles will release dopamine into the synapse, okay, so that the dopamine, in this case, will go to the receptors, okay, do their thing, okay, and then either get degraded, okay, or, sorry about that, or get degraded or uh, get reuptake, like I told you before. Now, this is optimal activity, and on a scale, this is what it looks like. Your, your neurotransmitter stores are good, the activity is just fine. Okay, when you encounter stressors, okay, the stress increases the neurotransmitter activity. In other words, more neurotransmitters are needed at the synapse and the stores become depleted. Okay, and this is a process that takes some time. Okay, you have high activity, you're able to respond to the stress, and it's a good thing. But if you'll notice the scale, okay, the activity goes quite high and the neurotransmitter stores start dropping. Okay, when you have chronic stress, the, the fact is that the stressors use up the neurotransmitters rather quickly, and we can only produce neurotransmitters at a particular rate, even if there's no problems, even if the system is perfect, okay, we can only produce it at a, at a particular rate. So what you have here is optimal looking activity because the stores are decreasing, and they're decreasing rather chronically. And look at the scale again. Okay, the scale is the neurotransmitter activity starts dropping, the stores are dropping, but you don't even have symptoms yet. Okay, this is this is the thing. You don't have symptoms yet. This is happening way before you have symptoms. Okay, now when the stores are depleted, you have inadequate neurotransmitter levels because the stores have nothing in there. The warehouses have nothing in there. So it doesn't matter how hard you try. There's simply low activity. Now, this is where you get symptoms, where the neurotransmitter stores have bottomed out the activity is bottomed out, and now you become depressed. Now you become anxious. Now you have whatever. Okay, 
reuptake inhibitors, if we go back one slide, okay, give you, go back two slides, sorry, prevent some of the reuptake and give you optimal looking activity because what they're doing is preventing the reuptake by inhibiting some of the receptors that would tell you to reuptake the serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine or whatever it happens to be, okay? Really what's going on, what we really must understand is that by the time you have symptoms, you have incredibly low neurotransmitter stores and the reuptake inhibitor will work, give you optimal looking activity, but if you're lucky between five and 10 years before you simply have absolutely nothing, because these medicines do nothing to talk about the uh, why you're like this, okay? Why you're not getting the neurotransmitters that you're looking for. So when people argue about, well, neurotransmitters have nothing to do with mood disorders, okay? What they're really saying, and they're saying it inartfully in my estimation, what they're saying is you should be concentrating more on the rationale or the reason for the low neurotransmitter or the neurotransmitter imbalances, the low neurotransmitter, you know, um, storage, however you want to put it. Okay, instead of treating from the bottom end by treating the neurotransmitter imbalance or the supposed symptoms, you should be looking at the rationale or the reasons or the root causes, if you will. Okay, my theory, my method of practice, which has been really successful, is to treat, identify and treat the root causes and treat why you're not producing your neurotransmitters. And then, as you can see, since your supplement, since you need the, to fill up these warehouses or vesicles, you need supplementation for a period of time because you cannot, serotonin, let's say, you cannot put enough tryptophan into your body to fill up those stores in anything like real time. Okay, you, unless you want to eat a turkey a day or two turkeys a day, it's not going to happen. Assuming that you're, you're, uh, you're in, assuming that your um, GI tract will handle it. Okay, so that's how this actually works. Uh, so you have to look at things from both both points of view. Interesting. So, um, how do you measure neurotransmitters in your patients, and which lab do you like to use? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I can see that you like to open up uh, Pandora's box of controversy. So <laughs> let, let me let me address the unanswered question. I use urinary neurotransmitter testing. Urinary neurotransmitter testing. Urine comes from the circulating serum of the body, okay? So whether you do serum neurotransmitter, platelet neurotransmitter, or urine neurotransmitter, you're taking it from the same pool. The ubiquitous argument is, and it's usually against urinary neurotransmitters, is that they don't represent central nervous system neurotransmitters, okay? And you know something? That's absolutely correct, okay? If you wanna measure central nervous system neurotransmitters, you have to get cerebral spinal fluid or take a biopsy of the brain, which is usually a bad thing to do with people, especially in your office. And to do a lumbar, listen, I was a, I've been an ER, an emergency department nurse, critical care nurse. I was head nurse of a coronary intensive care unit. You know, I've been in critical care. So, you know, I know how to do a lumbar puncture. I've never done one. I've seen it happen. Okay. But to, to do a lumbar puncture to get cerebral spinal fluid, which is usually done in meta, uh, meningitis and stuff, is not a benign procedure. Okay. Uh, and... Frankly, you're not going to do that on an on, on a office-based uh, basis. So urinary neurotransmitters give you a balance of what's in the periphery and what's in the central nervous system and are to be used as biomarkers. Biomarkers means that you don't take the number as an absolute. You look at the pattern. Okay, what's high, what's low, what's, you know, what's going on. You can tell the pattern, and then if you have somebody who has a particular symptom, you can correlate your nutraceutical or pharmaceutical intervention based on the pattern. Um, the reason I use urinary neurotransmitter testing is because there's been a ton of studies, a ton of research, and they have good um, databases. Uh, when I do a serum neurotransmitter test, and I'll, I'll, I'll make my typical joke, dopamine is normal between zero and 140, which begs the question, if I have no dopamine, is that normal? Okay. No, no, I'm serious. That's what the, that's what it says. Okay. Or if I see something that's 50, I'm just making up numbers now, 15 to 140. Does that mean 16 is normal? No. Okay. That's low. 
By the way, if you're ever looking at your a rule of thumb when you're looking at your lab tests, use Arwine's rule of thirds. I have to put my name on something, okay? <laughs> I mean, really, let's face it, right? Uh, take that reference range. It's a rule of thumb, not always, but it works pretty well. Take the reference range, divide it into thirds in your head, okay? If your number fits in the middle third, it's probably okay. If it's in the lower third, especially the lower part of the lower third, it's suboptimal. If it's in the upper third, it requires interpretation. I, you know, I look at people and I look at their blood tests and say, you know something, 12 to 16 for hemoglobin, you're 12.1, you're 250 pounds. I don't think that's good for you, okay? You're not, you don't have enough blood cells. You're not, you know, you're not bringing oxygen around. And they're like, but it's normal. I said, it's not normal, okay? That's an average. That's an average, okay? <laughs> no, that's great. I love this. Our, our, our mind's rule of thirds. Right yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know it's, silly, it's silly, but I just said, you know, Hashimoto's has got his thyroiditis. Everybody's got it. I said, you know, I'm going to put my name on something. It's pretty benign, but it will be okay. <laughs> I'll be remembered for it, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about organic acid testing as a way to get a sense of what's going on? Organic acid testing, by the way, happens to be one of the better ways of uh, discovering what is going on with your body physiologically. You know, uh, you, oh, I'm, I'm also an expert in epigenetics. That's kind of where I'm known, you know, in the MTHFR community and you know, I've been with Dr. Ben Lynch for many years and in the research and his strategy uh, application was my invention. I gave it to him because he's got money I don't. Okay. And he developed it and there's a new one coming out that's going to be better than anything that's been, uh, been previously here. So when you look at genetics, you're looking at probabilities. You can look at a pathway and say, gee, that pathway may not do well under oxidative stress, but you don't know. Okay. Organic acid testing tells you because that's the result of the pathways. So when it comes to the neurotransmitter part, you always have to remember that you're looking at metabolites, okay? So dopamine will metabolize either down the cascade of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, metanephrine, all the way down to something called VMA, or will go down the pathway where it becomes homovalinic as an HVA, which is what's measured. But always remember that, that pathway requires cofactors and coenzymes. So that pathway requires SAMe, B1, B2, B3, Okay, if you don't have enough of that, okay, you might get a false reading of low, okay, but you can read an organic acid test, you can see what's being absorbed, what's not being absorbed, you can see the reasons why, you can see the mitochondrial pathways, and yes, if you, if you correlate, remember, a test is only a test, you don't treat tests, you treat people, remember, doctors say that a lot, but then they treat the tests, so if, the part, if you walk out of somebody's office with a shopping bag of vitamins, that doctor is treating each line of a test. So before you spend three or four hundred dollars, walk out. Do me a favor, okay? Because that healthcare provider is supposed to correlate your symptoms with the testing, and then figure out what your body needs. And it's usually not done by reading one line after another after another, and then trying to supplement each line. Okay. So yes, organic acid testing is is one of the better ways of determining what's going on with you globally to include the neurotransmitters. Um, how does genetic testing help in uh, analyzing and treating mood disorders? Uh, genetic testing will give you a heads up into what areas might have problems, again, under an oxidative stress load. I say that a lot. Remember, oxidative stress is microbial stress. It is stress of biotoxins, of regular toxins, of the psychology. All of those things cause an increase in inflammation slash oxidating compounds slash oxidative stress. So, so uh, by the way, oxidative stress is also often known as free radicals, right? Exactly. Free radicals, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species. Okay, they kind of a bunch of names. It all comes from Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw back in the 70s, who wrote that big, thick book called Life Extension. I remember that. Yes, I actually read it. Oh, my I God. I too. Oh, I've got, I keep, you know, even when I move around, I guess, I, you know, books, you know, I do everything online anymore. But I keep that book because it's a badge of courage that I read it. You know, I was like, ha I, I love that book. But one I, thing I is I still have oh. in my memory those horrible images of them showing what they look like. No, um, no, please. Working out. It's, like, it's, it's burned in my brain. 
It's burned in my brain. Please, please. Hi, I'm strong. No, you're not. No, you're not. Don't show pictures like that. No, 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 no. Oh, God. You want to, you want to get a mood disorder? Look at those pictures. Yeah. And then, every, and then, of course, you know, uh, America came in, American business came in, and I won't say the bad word, but took pieces of it and said, oh, you could take this and lose weight and that. Right. By, by the way, for those who aren't familiar with this book, this was really the first book that came in and, and expressed clearly the uh, relationship between free radicals and antioxidants and disease. And this was the new key to solving the chronic disease epidemic. Exactly. It was, it was mainly about aging and how cells were injured. And they went and, and discovered the, uh, the ROSs, the reactive oxygen species, free radicals. Well, guess what? This is why Dr. Navio, the panel I just showed you, he took that concept, brought it way out, not only described what created the oxidative stress, but what that oxidative stress did to the homeopath, I'm sorry, the homeostatic mechanisms, so you know, what got your will, and what interfered with them, and how you can go about um, interrupting the forest fire. Okay, which takes it way out into orbit. Um, so genetic studies, well, you can look at different pathways. Uh, those people who are stuck in the MTHFR paradigm, okay, MTHFR does one thing and one thing only. It takes 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate and turns it into 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate. That's it. It's not a deity. It's not a devil. It's not waiting in the tall grass to get you. Okay, and the reason that people misinterpret is because when they first studied epigenetics, they looked at homocysteine and they said, gee, high homocysteine is a cardiac marker. MTHFR is connected to that. So if you have a polymorphism, they only checked two variants, by the way, there's C677T and 1298C, which are where they are in the particular uh, um, the person's genome. Uh, and they made the correlation that if we, if we treat this, which you can't treat a gene, okay, that we're going to control the homocysteine. But that didn't work out so well. So anybody who had any kind of chronic illness who was testing for this, so they developed databases because the erroneous conclusion was if you have MTHFR polymorphisms or SNPs, that's going to cause clotting. That's going to cause um, uh, uh, different, uh, different disorders. It's going to cause foot fungus, which is the last one's a joke. Okay? Uh, and that's not true. It's a combination of things. Okay, because that's one gene, one enzyme in a pathway, the folate pathway, going to methylation, going to methionine, and doing methylcobalamin and so forth. So when you look at genetic studies, where you look at the different, um, if you're looking at lists of genes, it's hard. But if you're looking at it into the pathways, you can say, you know, that pathway has a lot of polymorphisms. And if there's a lot of oxidative stress, we're not going to get the products we're looking for. So maybe I should look in that direction. So believe it or not, it's predictive in that if you look at it properly, you can say to yourself, gee, you know, uh, this person's mitochondria is kind of weak side, so let me look at the glutathione pathway. That recycling mechanism doesn't look like it may be working. Let me see if that's the reason, because, you know, that person can't create, recycle his glutathione, which is going to give you a lot of oxidative glutathione, and that's going to block the mitochondria. Okay, so you, you can have a big old heads up of where to look and then how to intervene, okay? It shortens the diagnostic process. So once you find out why, the how becomes, it's difficult, but the how becomes easier. But it's that whole finding out why. And a lot of my medical colleagues tend to stop at a certain area because we all know that, see, since you're a chiropractor, you'll understand this, the medical physicians kind of don't know, are not taught not to say three words, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> they would rather look and say, gee, I can't figure it out. It must be you. Don't ask me where that leap of logic came from. You know, it's in your head. Yes, it's in your head. It's in the neurotransmitters. Okay, but why, why you're blaming the patient because you can't figure it out. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Yet, if we look at the genetic pathways and don't take them as godlike or absolute, you can get a pretty good idea of how that patient will fail. A little hint for you and your listeners. Uh, you can know the genetic pathways, okay? If you want to know how they express, because they express differently in different people, even with the same pathways, ask the person who they look like. If that person, if, this, if your daughter looks like Grandma Gail, for instance, ask about Grandma Gail and what kind of problems she had, because they're going to express that way. 
that's the direction they're going to go. Not absolute, but that's the direction they're going to go. If Grandma Gail was a schizophrenic who committed suicide, God forbid, okay, and your daughter has chronic Lyme and has the same genetic disposition, you've got a problem that you might want to deal with a little bit more strenuously than if they just had a little bit of depression, okay? That's why that's a little diagnostic clue that tells you why things happen the way they happen. Also gives you a, you know, big jump onto the how. Um, I know every case is different and, you know, we mm -hmm. have to take it case by case, but can you give us a little more detail into maybe some of your treatment protocols, say, sure. say we have a patient with depression, you know, Absolutely. Not even, not, not even a problem. Let's say we have a patient with mild to moderate depression um, and, uh, you know, how would you work them up and, and give us sort of an idea of some of the types of protocols that you might use in treatment? Absolutely. Um, first thing is, uh, you know, in real estate, it's always location, location, location. In medicine, it's history, history, history. Okay. Um, Sir, Will, Sir William Ostel, uh, Ostel, in 1895, you know, said, you know, listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis, okay? Uh, Osler, I'm sorry, William Osler, um, was one of the founding fathers of Johns Hopkins. One of the things I teach, and I teach the practitioners, is how to use historical information. They, that's a lost art, by the way, okay? Because what happens is you fill out a history form, nobody really looks at it, and they go right to the chief complaint, okay? You take a really good history, you look for temporal relationships, this happened, then that happened, this happened, then that happened. That tells you where to look. It often tells you what's wrong. By, okay. by the way, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, if you take the practitioner training program through the Institute of Functional Medicine, they really do preach taking a, a very detailed, careful history, starting with birth and childhood and everything mm -hmm. else. They do, and they also teach uh, putting things on a timeline. Timeline, yeah. And when I took some of their courses, I'm sitting there, and they, they put it all, and people are drawing on this timeline. I'm like, you know, like, you finish them, like, you know, okay? Because I've been practicing like that for at least a decade before I did that. And that's, I looked at the little arrow they used, and I said, not a bad idea. <laughs> you know, good idea. Because you're forcing people to use it and then take the information. So now, if you, you take that information, and if you have testing or if you do testing, they should be targeted to what your suspicions are, okay? So you have somebody who's got depression, you know that you have neurotransmitter imbalance. So if you have do an organic acid test, a, uh, the neurotransmitter testing, by the way, I, I used to use Pharmacon Labs, but they're not in existence any longer. I, I tend to use Labrix right now, um, and they do a pretty good job. Uh, Which is now owned by Dr. Stata. Yes, exactly. Okay. And Doctors Data does a good job. It's a blood test, though, in their neurobiologic amines. Okay. Uh, the Labrix is a urine test, which is, a, by the way, just a whole lot easier to get. Okay. You're going to get the same information. You're going to get the same patterns. Okay. Uh, and uh, you can also get from the urine the cortisol levels. Okay. And the four point cortisol, if, you, if you're getting from the, uh, you can get from urine with the Dutch test, but uh, you can also get the saliva test that will tell you what the adrenal cortex is doing, as well as the adrenal medulla gives you an insight into that. Uh, what I'll do is, um, normally I'll do an organic acid test if it isn't already there because it gives me so much information. If they have the genetics, I'll look at the genetics and see where the probabilities are. Okay, but that's only telling me the why, okay, why they're like that. I also listen for what the probabilities are for the root causes, okay? And that can be, that's really wide. You know, people, once you develop a relationship with them, they will tell you any, everything and anything, okay? They may have had, uh, you can almost tell somebody has had a severe psychological trauma if there's portions of their childhood they cannot remember, okay? Uh, they blocked it out. It's, it's a very, it's a very, I see this with, uh, with women who've been uh, abused sexually in their childhood, usually by family members. It's a terrible thing, okay? And I don't, I don't, you know, have them talk about it or anything. I just recognize it as being a form of PTSD. Okay, I'll listen for, you know, if they're a camper or, or if they went uh, if they went out of the country and they had diarrhea and, and their stomach was never really the same. Okay, I mean, if they went to Cambodia, I know they got parasites. Okay, let's, yeah. let's, let's call it spade a spade. You know, uh, Lyme disease is rampant. Okay, Lyme disease you always have to consider. Uh, don't look at the maps because those are the CDC positives. Lyme disease is everywhere. They have found Lyme disease in the emperor penguins in Antarctica. 
Wow. Okay. And those the ticks were brought over by the seabirds. Okay. Let's face it, it's everywhere. So you must consider it and have you have to know how to test for it. You have to know how to read the test. You have to know which tests to do, okay, at what stages. And that becomes a bit of a quagmire because Lyme disease diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis, not a testing diagnosis. Okay, but there's a whole mess of things that can cause it, thyroid problems, um, not just the polymorphisms, you know, strep, uh, anemias. Uh, this it's it's endless okay so when you have that gut, gut you, disorders um, especially thank you very much i appreciate it uh, gastrointestinal leaky gut syndrome is the major reason for and it could be primary or secondary it can happen and then you have the problems or you can have problems and that and then the leaky gut can happen but all the antigens getting through the gut into the basement membrane cause an immunological dysregulation that causes chronic inflammation, chronic neurotransmitter imbalances, chronic, a whole mess of things. So when you're treating somebody, regardless of what the testing says, okay, it's a good bet to treat leaky gut syndrome. So we talked about treatments. Well, my treatments are based on treating the foundation of the body first, which is decreasing stressors, okay, which is environmental stressors, you know, drinking good water, getting good air, asking about their house, you know, because a lot of people are sick in their houses and they don't, they've never tested for mold. And it's a very easy test to do. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Okay. Uh, generally cleaning up their environment as best as they can within their means. Okay. Uh, we can have people buy, you know, horrendous, horrendously expensive house water filters. But if they, if they're a, you know, a family with three children with a single provider, you know, provider who's bringing in the money, uh, maybe just a Brita filter would be okay. At least you can get most of it, okay? Uh, looking for, um, you know, re decreasing other kinds of stress. If you have somebody, you know, giving them advice in certain areas, some people who need certain type of uh, therapies, EMDR, EFT, you know, things like that. Okay, then you want to heal the cells themselves because leaky cells, dysfunctional cells are a common ubiquitous issue, okay? And that's supplying um, vitamins and minerals that will get into the cell and phospholipids that will help rebuild the cell walls. Now, when you're having gut problems, that becomes a real issue. So you start thinking about transdermal or liposomal products, okay? Once you start attending to that, a lot of times people start getting better just by virtue of the fact that everything begins to work. Okay, then simultaneously with that, I'm going to fix the gut almost in everybody because I have a meta person doesn't have leaky gut, regardless of what the leaky gut tests say. Okay, by the way, that's the worst test in the world. Okay, <laughs> if, the, if you have a test that says you don't have leaky gut and you have a chronic illness, throw it out. Okay, and if you don't believe me, here's, here's a way of thinking about it. Think of the risk benefit factor. What is the risk of giving somebody digestive enzymes? let's say a demulsion herb, maybe, maybe colostrum or something else to heal the cells, and probiotic versus what happens with leaky gut syndrome, which is chronic inflammatory response. No risk and the probability of benefit if you seal up that gut is incredibly high. So when you have that kind of safety profile, you treat the blessed thing, all right? If you do that, you prevent antigenic entry, which lowers inflammation, which is what most of the body's energy is just trying to do every day is, is drop inflammation. And then it becomes more specific and individualized. I'm always considering mitochondrial function, okay? And that is comparatively easy these days to support, okay? You can use coenzyme Q10, PQQ. You can use a transdermal patch that has everything in it, okay? Depending on your, uh, the individual and, you know, their lifestyle. And you have to consider that and how well they're going to take the nutraceuticals. You have to consider the nutrients that are going in. If they can't absorb it, then, you know, give them things that are more easily absorbed, either... On a, on a, you know, protein powder basis, or at least, you know, talk with them about being on an anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, AIP paleo is, is kind of a typical thing that, you know, kind of works with a lot of people, but it doesn't work with everybody. You have to be individualized about it, but, you know, you want to kind of stay, you know, pull back from grains and sugar and, you know, go more in the anti-inflammatory range. Okay. And that's easily looked up. And there's a couple of books out there that are not expensive. Um, and then I get real specific as to what I'm treating. It depends on what I've tested for. If we have Lyme disease, if we have, we start getting to the root causes, okay? And if we have neurotransmitter imbalances, uh, the guidance for that is very simple. 
<clears throat> if you treat the inhibitory neurotransmitters before the excitatory, uh, which means you want to increase GABA. Okay, GABA is GABA amino butyric acid is the particular molecule that calms the human brain. Okay, that is available in a liposomal form uh, from Quicksilver Scientific. Okay, it's also available in the phenylated form. Now, I know everybody argues with me about phenobates or phenobites. Okay, the reason for that is that the common one is a beta phenyl gamma amino butyric. Forget the big word. Okay, that's the one you usually buy. It has all kinds of problems. But there's another molecule, with, uh, the formula 3 phenyl butyric, that comes out of Eastern Europe. All the studies for those were done in Eastern Europe and were done in Russian. I happen to speak Russian and read Russian, so I've read the studies, and they don't have it. I've been using this stuff for decades, okay? No problems whatsoever. It gets through the blood-brain barrier. The reason things like pharma GABA and the regular GABA is done is they're water-soluble. They don't get through the blood-brain barrier. If you get better with those common GABAs, that's proof positive you have a leaky blood brain. So what, what form of GABA are you talking about that's used in Russia? Uh, it's, it's um, well, let me bring it down to what you can get here. Uh, from biotics, it's called phenotropic, okay? From um, the Neuroscience Corporation, it's called Cavanase. Um, I'm sure a couple of other people have, but those are the two products I use. It's the 4-amino-3 phenylbutyric acid. It's a, people argue with me that it's just a nomenclature thing, but I'm going to tell you, that those molecules, the ones I've used, have never had any problems and I've been using it for decades. So either that one or the liposomal one yeah. from uh, Quicks. Right. Liposomal works really well. Okay. I've had people like this in front of me. I'm like, open your mouth. Yeah. Open your mouth. <laughs> you know, like four sprays and I wait there for five minutes and then they're sitting back going, oh, right. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I'm not giving them, remember the difference between a benzodiazepine and giving somebody GABA is a benzo stimulates the GABA A receptor to release GABA. And the constant use of, of benzos damages the GABA A receptor. That's why I have so many problems. Okay, giving somebody GABA gives them what they need without stimulating the receptor. And yes, it, you burn through it after a while. Okay, serotonin, you can give somebody L-tryptophan or better yet, 5-hydroxytryptophan. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, early on, we were giving people just L-tryptophan, and some people were getting excit excitatory with it. So in the late 90s, um, Kelly Olson, PhD, who was the R&D director at neuroscience, found a pathway, okay, that tryptophan can actually connect to it, uh, an enzyme called IDO. That enzyme, when it's stimulated by inflammation, yeast, microbes, stress, will start looking for substrate, pulls tryptophan out of the pathway and creates chyurenic acid, which is neuroprotective, and then quinolinic acid, which is a nasty excitotoxin. Then it produces NAD, which is B3, which I think is a hell of a way to get B3 for your body. Okay, you have to go down, down that pathway. But the quinolinic acid is what creates the excitation. So under inflammatory conditions, tryptophan is pulled out of the pathway that should create serotonin, but doesn't. Okay, part of it's pulled out at least. Okay, so you're creating excitation on top of excitation from the microbes, all right? So that's the reason people don't use tryptophan. So we went to 5-hydroxytryptophan. This tryptophan is metabolized uh, with BH4 and iron and B6 to 5-hydroxytryptophan. It's a one-way pathway. So if we use that, we can create serotonin, and then the serotonin will either get degraded or become melatonin. You need serotonin for practically everything. 80% of it is produced in your gut, which is one of the reasons we have so much serotonin problems because we have so many gut problems. So you're not producing the serotonin, all right? And so you can take SSRIs as much as you like. And yes, it will work for a while by increasing the serotonin of the synapse. If you don't correct the problem, that will fail. And in typical medical thinking from, from Big Pharma, it's not working, let's give you a Bilify. An atypical antipsychotic? Are you crazy? We're not crazy. We're just greedy. I know that. But you're also crazy. Okay, if you say so. But you're nobody. You're a chiropractor. I'm like, whoever I can influence, I will. Okay? <laughs> when it hits you, it'll be like a tsunami. Okay? <laughs> because it's just, let's do more. Let's, you know, mm. <laughs> let's not fix you because we're in a chronic disease management society. Okay? There's no money in curing cancer. There's money in treating cancer. There's no money in, treat, in curing diabetes. There's money in treating diabetes. You ever wonder why there's such a 
thing against Lyme disease. I mean, there's no Lyme disease in Australia. You know why? They don't allow the diagnosis. <laughs> How can you have it if there's no diagnosis? And they have people believing there's no Lyme disease there. The duh. Okay. <laughs> and England at least has turned around because of certain things. But the longest time I would, you know, somebody would get a positive Lyme test, they'd do their own test. It was always negative. So they treated people for chronic fatigue and depression. The downstream effects. There's more money in treating the downstream effects than there is in curing the disease. Yes, the consciousness is raised towards Lyme, but how many other things are doing that? You know, we have to be our own advocates. You know, the unfortunate thing is we've lost our general practitioners. We've lost our generalists who used to be the kings that coordinated everything. Okay, now we have specialists, specialists, specialists who are very, very good at what they do, but that's all they do. They don't coordinate with one another. Okay. So the coordination or correlation or putting the dots together, putting the puzzle pieces together is left to the person who is least trained to do it. And that's the patient themselves. Okay. Yeah, that's, that is, that's because of the insurance model that limits yes. the amount of time that doctors can afford to spend with patients because of the reimbursement absolutely. rates, which they absolutely to talk about, but unfortunately that's the reality of it. They're forced into eight minutes of patient to include the documentation time. You're absolutely correct. Most of the doctors I know, are frustrated as heck because if they can even uh, even tap at the chief complaint that's all they can do they don't have the time and they're not allowed the time that's the whole thing they're not allowed the time but but this is why i think patients would be best served and by the way i've i, I think i i have to end it here but um, okay. well, uh, i think they, most patients would be best served having both a conventional primary care doctor and a functional medicine doctor like yourself or myself and right. working as a team together because you know we we can have some of the time that the primary care doctor doesn't have because we're not going to be limited by exactly you know, by being that, that's coming that's coming to fruition i see it in england now I, I i travel around i travel around the world treating people but i see it a lot in england now i see it a lot here where there's true core there's true cooperation happening okay that's what you look for in a in a um and a functional medicine or a healthcare provider, somebody who's willing to advocate for you, court, you know, do the correlation, uh, and coordinate with your other healthcare providers. That's, that's great. That's the, that's the great. So, Doctor Doctor Armine, this has been a <laughs> wonderful discussion. I'd love to Thank you. continue it. Um, unfortunately, I'm up against the hard break. So, I know, um, man. Can you tell us uh, how practitioners and patients can get a hold of you and contact you? Well, certainly they can go to my uh, they can go to my website uh, at uh, drjessarmine.com. Okay, and uh, what I offer that a lot of people don't is I offer a 15 minute get acquainted session. You can schedule that, and we can discuss your problem, uh, and then I can tell you if I can help you or not, which I makes me comfortable, makes you comfortable. Okay, that's the way that people can access me. They certainly can go to my website and make an appointment. Uh, most people speak with me on that little 15 minute get acquainted session and. We can really determine, you know, in that short a period of time, if this is an appropriate case for me. That's the best way to get it done. That's great. Excellent, Dr. Armine. Keep doing the good work. I'll talk okay. to you soon. You take care now. Thanks so much.